and the kingdom of darkness with light, and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ, to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel the of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of and Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 2, the scripture says, Behold, a leper came to him and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. We welcome you today to our study of the gospel of Matthew. And specifically today, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapters 8 through 11 at Jesus the compassionate king. Remember, the Gospel of Matthew is all about Jesus as the greatest king ever, and today we're going to see his compassion in this section. We hope you'll get your Bible and be ready to study these chapters with us today. What a marvelous request this leper makes of Jesus. He, you can imagine the scene. Lepers were ostracized by the Jewish community. No friends, no family failing health, everything's bleak and grim, and yet this man approaches Jesus. He comes to Him, the Bible says, and worships Him, and here's His request. Lord, if You are willing, You can make me clean. How did Jesus address this man? Did He say, hey, you're a leper. You know, you're not supposed to be around anybody. Did He, did he look down on him? Did, did He condemn the man? What did He do? Notice Matthew chapter 8, the beautiful words of Jesus, the compassionate King, in Matthew 8 verse 3. The scripture records, Then Jesus put out His hand and touched Him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately His leprosy was cleansed. Now, this is a very unique setting and a unique scene on so many various levels. Lepers weren't supposed to come close to anybody. According to the old law, they were to be banned from the community. And yet this man knows. He's heard about Jesus. He's heard about His miracles. He knows who He is. And he has the audacity to come to Jesus, fall down before Him, worship Him. I know you can make me clean. Watch what Jesus does. He touches the man. Who's going to touch a leper? He touches the man. I'm not doing that, are you? He touches him. I'm willing. Be cleansed. What a wonderful, compassionate story this is. This man who has this physical predicament that nobody can deal with, who's ostracized by everybody, who's exiled and banished to a life of isolation, Jesus makes him completely clean. He's now like everybody else. Can you imagine how that just even physically affected the man? But friends, as we think about Jesus, the master healer, in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, can't we see even a, a more spiritual application of this? You know, this leprosy, this disease that this man has is a lot like the sickness of sin. Sin causes us to be separated from God, does it not? Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, The Lord's ear is not heavy that He cannot hear, His arms not shortened that He cannot save, but your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. Just like this man's physical disease, let's realize that sin is the ultimate and great spiritual disease. It's destructive. The way of the transgressor is hard. Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 15. Sin, like multiple times the leprosy itself would lead to death, sin is a deadly disease. The Bible says in Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. And friend, just like in the day of Jesus, Leprosy was incurable by man. Sin is the sickness spiritually that man cannot cure. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, God made Christ who knew no sin 
to be sin on our behalf. 1 John 2 verses 1 and 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours alone, for the sins of the whole world. This man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Only God and only Christ can heal the sin problem. And friend, let's realize sin, like leprosy, as we mentioned, causes a great separation. Under the Old Testament, the leper wasn't to be around anybody in the camp of Israel or any Israelite. Sin separates me from my God and the blessings and the benefits of God. As we said, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, sin separates a man from God. And so here we picture sin as the great disease. And friend, just like with this leper right here, what, what a compassionate Savior. The man comes to Jesus and listen to his language. You can hear the, the, the desire in his language. If you're willing, you can make me clean. Is Jesus willing? Touches the man. Listen to this now. I am willing. Be cleansed. If sin is the great disease, friend, we've got to see Jesus as willing and desirous of cleansing every person's sin. That's God's ultimate desire, is it not? The Bible says God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. The Bible says God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God wants all men everywhere to be saved. And Jesus went to the cross to make that possible. He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live by whose stripes we are healed. And so in this beautiful, compassionate picture of the leper, can we not see ourselves in sin? And can we not see Jesus as the master healer not only of leprosy, but ultimately of the sin that has struck the whole world by our own desire, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Now, in Matthew chapter 8, we also direct our attention to the, the humility and the faith that a centurion possessed who Jesus now encounters. Look at Matthew chapter 8, and I want you to notice verses 8 through 12. The Bible records these words. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come down under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Jesus speaks the word. Same hour, his servant is healed. But what Jesus identifies about this man is his great faith. Hey, my servant, he's paralytic, he's homesick. I, I, I'm not worthy for you to come in my roof. If you'll just say the word, that will suffice. Look at his humility and look at its faith, his faith. The Bible says, whoever humbles himself, will be exalted. He who exalts himself will be humbled. Luke 14, 11. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He'll exalt you in due time. 1 Peter 5, 6 and James chapter 4, uh, verse number 10. We need this type of, of humility and faith. Whatever God says, whatever He tells me to do, whatever He commands me, I am more than willing to trust and to follow the Lord and Savior. Now, here's another powerful and practical lesson from the Gospel of Matthew. Here we have an account in Matthew chapter 8 uh, of a great healing that Jesus is going to do on Peter's mother-in-law. And watch what she does in Matthew 8 verse 15. The Bible says, verse number 14, when Jesus had come to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever, so he touched her hand and the fever left her. Now watch this. And she arose and served them. The practical lesson that we especially want to highlight here is this. Christians are healed to serve. We're saved to serve others. When I obey the gospel, and my sins are forgiven, and I become a, a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. When I rise out of the waters of baptism to walk in newness of life, I come out of that a new creature in especially the sense that my life is different now. I've been saved and healed from the sin problem to serve others. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19 and 20, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, 
You were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. I want to do my best in this life to serve others. Mark 10 verse 45, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give His life a ransom for many. I am to be faithful unto death, and especially as I strive to serve others in the community and in the world in which I live. Now, another powerful lesson that we learn from Matthew chapters 8 through 11 is that our Lord indeed does have the power to forgive sins. Look at Matthew chapter 9, and I want you to especially notice verses 1 through 6 with me. The Bible says, So Jesus got into a boat, crossed over, and came to His own city. Then, behold, they brought to Him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, that's the faith of the friends of the paralytic, He said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes? But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, He said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Friend, how encouraging it is from this lesson to realize our Lord has the power and the ability to forgive sins. I need to know that. You need to know that. Every person in the world of an accountable age needs to know that because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3 verse 10 and Romans chapter 3 verse number 23. And thus, as we think about Christ, as we think about His life, as we think about some of the great statements that He makes, let's realize His authority and His power demands He has the ability to forgive my sins and to forgive yours. Matthew 26 verse 28, Jesus, as He instituted the Lord's Supper, the Bible says He took that fruit of the vine and He said this to His disciples, This is My blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. You see, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9 verse 22, The blood of bulls and goats could never really take away sin. Hebrews 10 verses 3 and 4, But when Jesus says those powerful words, this is my blood of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Friend, how, how wonderful and encouraging it is to know it, when I obey the gospel, everything I've done that is contrary to the will of God has been completely removed. Acts 2 verse 38, Repent and be baptized every one of you for the remission, removal of sin. God said, I'll be merciful to their sins, their lawless deeds I'll remember no more. Hebrews 8, verses 12 and 13. And so when I obey the gospel, Jesus has the power, the authority to wipe the slate clean. I get a fresh start. Everything I've done that's contrary to the will of God is now removed. And I can have a do-over in this life. You know, as we think about some of the great lessons from uh, Jesus' life in Matthew's cha Matthew chapter 8 through 11. We also learn in Matthew chapter 9, especially verses 27 through 31, that Jesus also has the ability, as He did in this example, to open people's eyes. Look at Matthew 9 beginning in verse number 27. The Bible records these words. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed Him crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about Him in all that country. Now, no doubt, 
These men are so excited. They've been blind. Now they can see the miraculous power of Jesus heals them with just a touch and their eyes are opened. But friend, from a spiritual standpoint, hasn't Jesus opened our eyes spiritually speaking? Classic example is that of the prodigal son. The father gives him his inheritance. He goes out into that far country. He lives it up. Everybody's his friend until one day he wakes up broken in the pig pen. And the Bible records in Luke 15 that that man finally came to his senses. He came to himself and he said, My father's hired servants have it better than me. I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to say, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be a son. Make me a servant. Here's the father with open arms waiting on him. That man's eyes were finally opened. He finally saw what he needed to see. And friend, like these two blind men, every child of God who has turned from sin and to God, eyes have been opened. They now look at life differently. They now have a different priority. They now are looking up. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Colossians 3 verse 1. They're now seeking new goal and have a new vision in this life. Seek first the kingdom of God. Our eyes are opened. We now see the world differently. We're looking at it no longer through a worldly lens, but through a lens of the spiritual things that we have in this life through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, we mentioned one last thing in Matthew chapter 9 that really stands out from the teaching of Jesus, and it is the, the dire need that Jesus expresses to speak and to teach the gospel. Jesus is here again, seen for His compassion. Matthew 9, verses 36 and 37 says this about the compassionate King. The Bible records, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of hosts that he will send out laborers into his harvest. See the compassion of Christ this multitude, what are they like? They're like sheep wandering aimlessly without a shepherd. Jesus looks on them with compassion. That means He had love for them in His heart. And He said to His disciples and gave them, in essence, a, the, the, the commission, the, the great work to do. Harvest is plentiful. Laborers are few. Pray the Lord of hosts He'll send out laborers into His vineyard or His harvest. Friend, the world, the lost people in this world are that harvest. Like Christ, we ought to have compassion on them and we are the laborers who ought to be taking the gospel to the world. Luke 19, 10, The Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said to His followers, Go into all the world and preach the gospel unto it. And so we have that great charge and motivated by the same compassion Jesus had. We ought to look at the world with great love in our hearts, hoping and praying they will obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We now turn our attention to Matthew chapter 10, and, and we'll briefly mention some things from Matthew 10 and 11 that also show us the great compassion and love that Jesus had for His followers. In Matthew 10, both in verse 22 and in verse 28, Jesus teaches us what's necessary to be saved. Jesus says these words, He who endures to the end will be saved. What's it take? What, what did the Lord tell us you've got to do to be saved, to ultimately make it to that beautiful place called heaven? Don't ever give up. Endure. Stay steadfast. Be immovable. Hang in there and, and never give up. Be persistent is the idea that Jesus says. Over and over again in the Scripture, we're taught that we do have the command and the power to do that. Be faithful unto death, Jesus said. I'll give you the crown of life. I, I have the ability to choose who I'm going to serve. Joshua 24, verse 15. And friend, if I remain faithful unto death, the Bible says I will receive one day the crown of life. Now, Jesus also taught us that a big part of being faithful to Him means that we're willing to live up to and really live up to the great confession that each of us have ascribed to in this life. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 
Jesus speaking. In verse 32 and 33, Jesus says these words to every one of His followers. The Lord said, Therefore, whoever confesses Me before men, him I will also confess before My Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies Me before men, him I also will deny before My Father who is in heaven. What's it going to take to really follow Christ? I'm going to have to confess Him. And friend, I understand initially this applies to obedience to the gospel. Hearing the Word of God, believing in Jesus, confessing Him as Savior, repenting of sin, and no doubt obeying His command to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin. But friend, the idea of confessing Christ isn't just tied to a one-time confession with the mouth. It is a confession daily. It is a daily desire to follow Jesus. Luke 9 verse 23, Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. I've got to every day strive to do my best to live faithful unto the Lord and never ever give up on the preaching of the gospel and the teaching of His Word. In fact, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 19, that's exactly what we see. We're introduced to one of the most powerful gospel preachers, or reminded of one of the most powerful gospel preachers in all the world, John the Baptizer. And this man, he wasn't a reed shaken by the wind. He, was, he had a backbone and he had a spine. Jesus said of men born of woman, none is greater than John the Mercer. What, what made John so great? He stood for truth. He was a unique man. He wasn't like everybody else. He went against the grain and following God's will. And he even was ultimately going to give his life for the cause of Christ. He stood up in every way for the preaching of the gospel. How the world needs more men and women who will stand up, say what God needs to say, tell others about the truth of God's Word, and be willing to teach that message. You see, the Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 11, If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. We are to preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We're to speak the whole counsel of God. Acts chapter 20, verses 27 through 28. And just as our Lord did, we need to boldly proclaim the truth in love. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 15. Now, friend, we close our lesson today with one of the most beautiful of all invitations. Maybe you've heard a lot of great invitations to obey the gospel. You won't find one any better than this in all of Scripture. Listen to Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse number 28. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is like. Think about how powerful that is. Jesus said, come unto me, and, and here's the audience. All you who labor and are heavy laden. Who hasn't at one time felt the burden of sin, the labors and the toils and the struggles, of fighting Satan and fighting sin and, and resisting it in their life. You know, the psalmist said in Psalm 38 verse 4, My sins have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me to bear. Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. The hope, the joy, the eternal rest, no more fighting of sin, no more struggles, no more pain, no more death, no more crying. There remains a rest for the people of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. That's the rest Jesus promises. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You'll find rest for your souls. Friend, don't you want to go to heaven? More than anything, don't you want to live with God forever? Can't you imagine how wonderful it's going to be in the presence of God, before the throne of God and the throne of Christ for all eternity? Don't you want that to be yours? If so, accept the Lord's invitation. 
obey the gospel of Christ before it's too late. Do you, do you really believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Savior of the world? John 8 verse 24. Does that belief motivate you to change your life? Acts 3 verse 19. Repent and turn that your sins may be blotted out. Would you confess the name of Jesus before men? Romans 10 verse 10. And as the Apostle Paul was told, would you arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. We hope and pray today that the great invitation of the Lord motivates you to obey the gospel and follow Him every day of your life. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. To God be the glory, and to God be the glory, this is the Gospel of Christ.